Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar. I'm David Shaw, the Publishing Director for Family Business Magazine, and I'm so very glad that you could join us. I hope that you and your family members are all well. The end of the year is fast approaching, and that means not only the holidays, but also increased pressure to manage equity events, gifting decisions, and governance planning. What you do or don't do now may have long-term unintended consequences. Today's webinar is going to look at those end of year issues through the lens of an active embedded family office that is working on planning these very things in real time. We'll look first at understanding exactly what an embedded family office is, and then at how to use structured governance to avoid overburdening the family office staff at year end. And then we'll outline what those key year end tasks are and finally discuss some gifting and succession best practices. It's an awful lot to go through, but I think you'll enjoy this one. Before we begin, uh, some of our quick housekeeping details. If you haven't joined us before, we welcome your questions and especially your thoughts and comments throughout the session. Just use the ask a question bar down below uh, uh, the screen that you see there. We'll go for no more than 60 minutes today and get to as many questions and comments as we can. So joining me for today's discussion are Aaron Smith and Graham McConnell. Aaron is the Senior Family Office Manager at Vermeer Corporation and serves as a primary conduit between the family shareholders and the company concerning governance, education, communication, and next-gen development. Uh, Vermeer has a unique uh, uh, embedded family office approach that I think you'll enjoy learning about. Aaron is going to be led in conversation by Graham McConnell, who is the CEO and co-founder of Enthround. Before Enthround, Graham served as product owner for Relay Network, managing priorities for a team of software developers and test engineers. I had the pleasure of working with Graham multiple times before, and I'm glad to work with him again. Welcome, both of you. Uh, Graham, I will leave things to you uh, to get started with this, and I will be back with questions. Great. Thank you. Thanks, David, and thanks to, to the entire family business team uh, for hosting this. Uh, and also thank you to Aaron for, for being here. Um, I wanna start just by, I know that David gave a little bit of a background on you, but um, I wanna dive a little bit deeper. Uh, and I think you probably know why I'm asking these questions. I, I've been lucky to uh, to visit uh, Vermeer and see the absolutely stunning uh, you know facilities that you have here, that the plant, it's at a scale that is really hard for me to put into words. Uh, so I'm, gonna, I'm hoping that you can maybe put that into words a little bit, but also, um, your career and how you, um, you know, went from growing up kind of in a, uh, your dad being at Vermeer, and then you found your way back to Vermeer. And to me, every time I hear you describe it, it feels like you're building your own legacy, you know, within the company, which is really, really cool. Um, so I know that's a lot, but hoping that maybe you can just give some background on, on all of that. Yeah, appreciate it. And thank you, Graham, for, for leading me today in conversation. And thank you, David, as well, and the Family Business Magazine team uh, for all your work in organizing this. Um, as Graham was kind of describing there, um, Vermeer Corporation, we're an industrial and agricultural manufacturer, um, largely based in Pella, Iowa, about 40 miles southeast of Des Moines, and have about 4,500 worldwide um, team members. Um, the company was started 76 years ago by Gary Vermeer, um, kind of a, a very unique uh, innovator and tinkerer, um, invented the large round hay baler, was his kind of claim to fame back in the early 70s. And then really um, accelerated some growth in the early 90s with the advent of horizontal directional drilling. That lays typically a lot of the uh, infrastructure for water lines, fiber optic, um, any kind of uh, infrastructure in neighborhoods, and really allows folks to, to not disturb the top of the ground. And so that's been incredible as we get into um, uh, all the advent of technology and, and such the last kind of 25-ish years in that. Um, and so our, we are, as, as Graham and, and everyone in this call is likely uh, with a family enterprise, we have 80 total family members, um, 67 or 68 of those members are shareholders. And so that is uh, an interesting um, job of mine. And I very much enjoy um, kind of helping them through every stage of life. Um, we actually just had a couple newborns here three or four weeks ago. 
And so excited to add uh, to the family member tally there. And as Graham was kind of alluding to as well, uh, my own personal journey is, is a little bit interesting. I grew up here in Ella, Iowa. Uh, my father served as general counsel um, for Premier Corporation for 27 years. Um, and so actually when the family group is a little bit smaller, um, his role would have encompassed largely what I do um, in the estate planning side of things and just helping kind of facilitate a lot of those conversations. Um, and so it, ever the good lawyer, he did not share any of that with me uh, while, while I was growing up. Um, and so it was uh, an interesting journey there. Um, but I always, I knew what the company uh, stood for, how they treated the community, the members, suppliers, um, everybody in their, in their circle. And so um, I've understood the value of the company um, and the value of it remaining family held. And so it's it's been a pleasure of mine to nearly the last two years um, kind of lead the family office here and, and help um, help the family as we get to uh, uh, expand our um, fourth generation offerings. Uh, as we've got 80 family members and a lot of those G4s are, are starting to come of age here in their 20s and, and late teens. And so I, I get to help facilitate a lot of unique conversations. And it is, uh, it's an enjoyable time for me. Yeah, that's that's great, and I, I love that story. Um, I as you know, I also work with my dad, uh, and so it's, I uh, you know, um, I know that you you know obviously didn't work there at the same time, but actually I I've been wondering this. Uh, Ryan Agri, uh, did he overlap with with your dad at all or no? So Ryan did indeed okay. um, overlap with my father for about ten or twelve years here okay. um, at Vermeer, and then. In an even smaller world, as, as many folks probably on the call know, that Palo Iowa is home to not just one, but two um, fairly large family enterprises. And so Ryan actually had some uh, significant experience over at Palo Corporation. Uh, they make very nice windows. And uh, and so it's a, it's an interesting town that I think, Graham, you've gotten to know fairly well. And we are, uh, at times, it feels like the center of the family enterprise world. I can understand that, definitely. Um, so I'm I'm thinking back to when uh, when we kind of first were introduced to Vermeer, and I remember being actually uh, at a family business conference um, and meeting Ryan. And at that point in time, uh, you know, this was I think a year before we even started working together. But uh, he was describing to me some of the um, I guess you could call it digital transformation, basically of the or transformation generally of the family office. Um, and I the the one thing that uh, was top of mind that we eventually you know, ended up building a solution together with you, which, uh, you know, we, we are grateful for, for that opportunity was around cost basis and um, going through the process of, you know, going back in time to the beginning and figuring out, you know, what is the cost basis or how has that changed as shares have changed hands. Um, and so I, I think that kind of leads us nicely into the topic of, you know, how family offices evolve over time. Um, and it, it's been a, a, an interest of mine recently, you know, getting to talk to different families that are in different stages of that process. Um, and, you know, we see some people that I think are a single individual that are very overburdened by the, the questions that are being, or, you know, the tasks that are being put on their plate. Uh, but then we also see uh, organizations like Vermeer, which I think are, you know, have done a fantastic job of of uh, creating, you know, an embedded family office. Um, so, if you don't mind, maybe you can talk a little bit about, you know, what are the roles of the of the family office at Vermeer and um, kind of what's expected and how have you got to this point? Um, yeah. Yeah. No, our in our governance and and the evolution of the family office has been a journey, and I guess that would be the the first um, place I would start uh, is that it is it's an evolu it is a journey. Um, and to start it is, is frankly, the hardest part. Um, and so we've, um, frankly, I think a lot of people probably on this call, or certainly David um, with Family Business Magazine, uh, was integral to the Vermeer family's adoption of a lot of best practices. Um, and so the family really started um, in the late 90s, early 2000s, of attending a lot of conferences and hearing, you know, how do I, or how should we organize um, our, our company and be aware of that three circle model that so many of us are familiar with. Um, and so how's, you know, our governance structure knowing that we would like to perpetuate 
um, the family ownership of the operating company and to really separate what tend to be emotional decisions um, into a far more um, logical framework. And so a lot of that hard work was done by Heidi Vermeer Quist um, and, and Ryan um, probably 12 to 14 years ago, um, where we finally separated out um, kind of that, we call it an ownership council. A lot of folks call it family councils. Um, and so that's for, for lack of a better term, that's our kind of board of the family. And that is separate and distinct from uh, the board of the business. And so that's very intentional. Um, we try to house those more emotional, what could be dramatic um, conversations in that board of the family. Um, and so that it, it is not trying to affect uh, uh, the other side. And our family office is largely organized around um, the governance of that ownership council. We've got two main committees, um, an education committee and a governance committee. Um, those two flow out of that ownership council. So ownership council gives um, a mandate on kind of what the purpose and scope is of what they're looking for, any goals that they would like to achieve um, with regards to that strategy and then let those committees carry it out. Um, us in the family office, it's myself and three others. Um, we carry out and execute on those plans, working with uh, the family members that are members of those committees. Um, and so that largely is how we're structured. We, we also do, um, you know, I, a large portion of my day to day is spent kind of liaising with um, estate planning attorneys, accountants, tax advisors, all the fun stuff that I think many of the folks on this call probably know and love. Um, we are not, we don't have any in-house um, councils or tax councils on that front. Um, and so a lot of that's farmed out. I find myself translating a lot in between. Um, and so that's that's the choice the family has made that may evolve. Um, and, and we are, um, as we move down into the G3s and G4s, I, I think my vision for the future would be that that probably does not remain the same. Um, so back to the, the, the kind of question at hand, it is for certain a journey um, and one that, that evolves as the family's needs evolve. Yeah. It's uh, to take that that last example there of, of estate planning attorneys. Uh, is there a um, do you have go to you know firms or people that you direct people to that kind of already have the context of you know how the how the business is structured or are you know are people free to go out and you know select their own um, you know I guess kind of is there a process for connecting people? And then having that, whatever comes out of those conversations comes back to you, presumably. Uh, we point. have, yeah, we have a preferred um, provider okay. list um, of a couple. And again, those folks have longstanding history with many of the family um, going back decades. And so that's incredibly helpful, both from a, a, a just prudent understanding perspective of uh, the, the estate planning attorneys know, um, you know, the folks in the business and and are very comfortable um, with where um, and how the business is doing. Um, and though there is no actual mandate from the family office to state that those are the only providers gotcha. that they are able to, to use. That would be probably something that, to be uh, candid. I, my guess is that that uh, would be something that we may be putting in place here at some point. Gotcha. Of we would only like for you to work with two or three. Uh, yeah. That because frankly, that's it's been difficult for me to filter all that communication and right. with with now eighty family members that uh, that grows exponentially every time. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. <laughs> um, so as it relates to equity, which uh, is of particular interest to me, um, so I know that that when we first started working together, you had another system in place, which uh, which is great. Uh, we work with a lot of companies that are coming from. Excel or even paper, which uh, you know makes it very hard to, to digitize. Um, I mean, it, what it, as we look towards the end of the year, I, what we see generally is that a lot of transactions take place, you know, at, at the year end. Um, it, do you see something similar? You know, is is there an advantage to having um, the estate planning kind of take place at the end of the year in in, in batches? There, there certainly are, and I, I think as you've, as you inputted our record number of transactions, I think <laughs> in the ER system that uh, um, you, you probably noticed a pattern. We, we try 
um, frankly, a lot actually at the beginning of the calendar year um, to do a lot of those annual exclusion gifting um, type pieces. We send out a memo to each of the families stating that, hey, here's the, the gift exemption for the year and uh, here's the, the number of shares we think that uh, are adequate to, to fill that up. Um, and so we get, I don't know, 50-ish percent of folks that probably do annual gifting in that period. And then there's probably the other 50 percent that do it uh, in the last week of December. Um, and so that's never the perfect time. But um, and I'm sure as everybody on the call is, is well aware, too, next year um, and 1231, 2025 is a pretty big date in the estate planning world. And uh, we're doing everything we can to avoid um, doing a lot of work in December of 25. So uh, trying to push those conversations as, as quick as we can, but knowing that uh, Family members move at different speeds, and, and some people um, just have different um, needs and circumstances. Um, things change. But um, I think to your point, too, it is why we saw the need to go with a um, more digital solution um, was just, uh, frankly, recognizing that our trust structure um, and everything around that was only going to exponentially grow. Um, so with 80 family members, we've got 120-ish trusts, and I assume that that number becomes 200 before it comes smaller. And so um, we we just knew that the Excel um, system we had in place and along with the other system was just not um, going to be sustainable. Um, and, and so this was a, a, your guys' solution was was a unique one that we thought also could could grow with us as our needs probably change and grow um, here over the next couple of decades. And so it's a, it's an exciting time and your team has been absolutely fabulous to work alongside. Well, I, I appreciate you saying all that. Oh, David's, David's uh, just, just a quick question. Uh, do you, do you have formal buy sell arrangements or, or agreements and what can you explain kind of how buying and selling it? First of all, how do you value the equity and then what can family members do with it? Yeah, we do. And, and that, to David's point, uh, that was actually one of my um, goals in my role this year was to get in place um, 100% uh, of the shareholders into a buy-sell agreement. So I can proudly state that, that we were able to achieve that this year. Um, unlike many um, probably family businesses on this call, or, or certainly ones I know Graham is um, used to dealing with in, in the private equity world, um, we actually do not um, have many uh, purchase events. Um, and our buy-sell actually is very limited in, in the number of, of uh, on, a, on the number of occasions that that would be possible. And so it's, it's really what, what we do in our share transfer uh, regime is simply um, the prudent estate planning and, and um, uh, trust planning that the family members are wanting to do. And so there is very, there's actually, I think it's on a number of uh, single digit times where we've had um, liquidity events essentially in, in the company. And so there are purchase events. Um, and so that's, while that uh, I think is good in a lot of respects, it also creates um, some interesting transaction history for Graham to, and his team to input <laughs> um, and for us and my staff to help facilitate when we do plan. Yeah. I uh, I have found no no two buy sell agreements look the same, um, not even close actually. Uh, I I think I was telling you that I was on site um, last week uh, with a window manufacturer, not not Pella, uh, but another one, and they have actually a, quite a strict um, system in place where, you know, if by age thirty three you're not employed, you or your spouse are not employed by the company. Uh, that triggers a, a sell event. Um, and then even beyond that, there are some rules around, you know, the shares should first be available to the people in their uh, tree, or sorry, in their branch of the tree. Uh, but if there's not enough demand amongst those other members, then it goes out to the, to the wider audience. Um, and so uh, anyway, I think it's, it's probably, you know, it's nice that you've uh, not had to kind of make those kinds of strict uh, restrictions on, on who is an eligible shareholder. Um, but are, are there other things that come to mind in, for you, like of what makes an eligible shareholder? And I'm sure it's all laid out in the, in the buy-sell agreement, but um, 
one of the problems we've that, got yeah we've got a couple kind of um odd rules on and we've got yeah our i guess equity structure is um, voting and non-voting um shares there um only bloodline um, folks can handle those voting shares um, and then there's actually a branch of the family that has an addendum to the buy sell agreement um, where any of their um, married ends can actually not hold uh, either voting or non-voting shares um, and so that obviously limits um, some of those folks ability to to plan um, or our our maneuvers um, to, to execute any um, estate planning work there um, so that's it's a difficult um, item to kind of work around, and then it's, yeah. it's not everybody sort of equal. That's our uh, the, the the interesting piece about the family on the whole is that their desire really is to to hold the operating company and perpetuate that down to G4s, G5s, G6s, and so it is Ryan and uh, the kind of history of the family office was really to. Uh, get them to see that those shares are are really not a financial asset. They're far more of an emotional asset. Um, and that presents a different uh, set of issues um, for us in the family office, but is is probably much different than I'm certain uh, most of, of many other family businesses on the call. Yeah. Uh, if, if we go back to the, the digitization of the family office, um, you know, I, I know that you have systems in place that allow family members to communicate amongst each other, uh, trusted family uh, being one of them. Uh, but in terms of their interface with the company, I mean, that's predominantly you and and Ryan and, and Molly, right? So they they pick up the phone and they, they talk to you directly. Um, I know that you also are in the process of uh, digitizing stock certificates, and maybe you're done at this point. Um, uh, and so that's, you know, that's been another thing that kind of comes to mind is, you know, you have this piece of paper that uh, has a lot of emotional value to it, uh, but um, it becomes a bit of a headache as those pieces of paper get, you know, put into 80 different drawers somewhere. And, you know, it's hard to, um, let's say they decide they now want to gift those shares, you know, having to redeem those, find them. Um, and then reissue, you know, new stock certificates. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, maybe talk me through a little bit about about that process of kind of digitizing and um, and how that's made a difference. Yeah, no, it's made a, a massive difference. And to your point, we we utilize trusted family quite a bit um, to communicate to the whole family group and to really make certain that um, everyone receives the same communication um, and, and at the same time. Um, and so that was an important we did. Um, a couple posts out to the family and also um, an in-person update. We hold an annual family camp every year for as much, much of the family as possible as can get together um, every mid-July. And so I took that opportunity to, to kind of dive down into what um, our move to uncertificated shares and your system uh, was going to mean for them and and kind of laid out um, that while we, we very much respect uh, that emotional hold, um, and value that, that folks place on that certificate, that it is, it's very difficult uh, with the number of shares we have and then just the geographic spread of the family um, to be able to, to help facilitate that in any um, uh, kind of logical and accurate way. Um, and so the move to this has been wonderful. We've got, we got buy-in um, fairly quickly after that session. Um, everybody uh, uh, across the family submitted their um, old, hard copy certificates and, and Molly did a, a wonderful job of integrating um, all that information, making certain that we had uh, all that accounted for and, and audited. Um, and then uh, your system is, is awesome and it allows actually the, the family members to produce a replica certificate if they still want that. Um, so I, I feel like everybody's kind of in a win-win here and it's uh, it's certainly gonna make our life easier as, as we start uh, November one year transferring a lot more shares. So, well, I uh, sincerely feel like the, the credit is shared because uh, you know you came to us with this uh, this challenge, this opportunity, and we've since had uh, a bunch of other families you know come to us with the same kinds of of you know um, needs, and so um, we we see it as you know a, a really great partnership because 
you don't want to build software without a, a real use case in mind. And we uh, and you led us in, in the right direction there. And so uh, very, very grateful for that. Um, so uh, I was going to also ask, so um, when this gifting takes place, you know, cost basis is associated with it. Um, and right now, that's something that that you and Molly, I think, are, are owning is someone picks up the phone and, and says, you know, I'd like to give some equity to my uh, some shares to my kids. And can you help me walk through this? And what's the most tax efficient way to do that? Um, we've we've thought about actually, and and we have a customer now that's saying to us, can we expose that form, you know, to even make it simpler? Can we say, uh, fill out this form, you know, tell us which tranches, for, for lack of a better word, of equity we want to transfer? Um, you know, is that something that you think, uh, you know, will eventually be the, the direction is uh, even stepping away from those those phone calls that I'm sure you feel uh, d daily? Are there are there cleaner interfaces that you can have so that people don't have to fully understand the buy sell agreement, but can can use software to to get the things done that they want to get done? No, I, I certainly hope that that we get there uh, because, to your point, it's uh, it's it's a lot to handle. Uh, yeah. I think those calls, and also um, while we have been, I think, blessed um, with with the trust that the family has placed in us to. To make certain that you know we are providing that uh, most efficient answer uh, on which shares to, to transfer, but certainly giving them, uh, I think, more power and clout to to do that uh, would never be a bad thing. And as uh, the the family starts to to continue to to spread geographically across the country and the world, that that uh, my guess is just only going to be more important, uh, given that. Uh, I can only field so many phone calls in a day. <laughs> so I'm I'm thinking now a little bit about the audience here and um, kind of the various stages that they're at. If you know if they're at uh, the very early stages of forming their family office, um, you know who do you think should be in charge of uh, year end planning and, and all of this uh, estate planning, you know related activities that go on, um, you know. Is it is it one person? Is it is it an you know um, outside help like you've talked about? Um, you know, for for that earlier stage, what would you suggest? Is you know who owns this? Yeah, it. I'm going to give the the wonderful answer of it depends probably, <laughs> okay. uh, and be deferential to that. But uh, no, I I I think having at least a, uh, you know, my guess is that this tends to lie with the CFO and general counsel um, quite a bit at, at a company level and certainly did um, uh, in the evolution of Vermeer's. Um, and that's where, you know, 25-ish years ago, that would have been where we were at, um, was largely this would have been my father as general counsel and uh, Mr. Van Dusseldorp as, as our CFO back then um, would have been working uh, hand in hand with that. Um, Though again, largely it would have been with outside counsel at kind of their direction because um, while my father loved uh, trust and estates was not, you know, that was not his only practice area. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think having a clear direction on forming that family office and that truly, uh, we actually just went through a continuous improvement event a couple of weeks ago as a family office staff and really identified along with the family that, you know, understanding the purpose and scope of what the family office is, is a very important um, point and one that uh, likely evolves, right? I, I don't believe that the purpose and scope of the family office is the same as it was when we moved into this space, uh, you know, eight years ago and wasn't the same as when they formed the concept back in 2008 or nine. Um, and so those things have to evolve and, and the family ultimately uh, has to give us direction on on how they want uh, us to, to kind of help execute. But uh, we can certainly, uh, I think, provide some good answers and um, have been blessed with, with them trusting uh, where we've, uh, I think, led them here over the course of the last decade and a half. Yeah. Um, well, it's, re it's really cool to hear about that, that evolution. Um, I may be changing topics a little bit and thinking ahead. Um, you know, are there areas that that you that you're currently focused on uh, evolving? Um, 
I know that one area that we are working on together is is proxy voting and and digitizing that piece of it. Um, you know, or, or you know, is is that you know really top of mind, or are the things even beyond that 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 you're thinking about in terms of the next evolution? For sure, it's I think largely that our our proxy voting, and then also um, our education of of the next gen really getting to understand what it means to be a beneficiary and a trustee of, of, of what they're going to inherit here fairly quickly um, and making certain that all those um, solutions or avenues for education are digital in nature. Um, because while most of our G2s grew up here in Pella and, and, and knew it well, um, that is not the case for the G4s. Um, and so that's uh, just the reality of what we, you know, need for them to, to understand what they're inheriting. Um, and yet they do not have the same kind of common upbringing and, and location. Um, and it makes whatever time then that um, they're able to spend with us in the family office or um, with their parents or outside advisors uh, talking about these things that, that every minute of, of those conversations is more fruitful if we can get them to, to understand things a little bit better. So that's, we're working uh, with another family business, uh, Tamron Learning, um, and their yeah. online platform to, to go through uh, a lot of stewardship uh, pieces there and then trustee and, and beneficiary basics there for a lot of our 20, what is our age range? 21 up to 33. Mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna have a cohort go through that. So yeah. excited to see what that does. And yeah. yeah. Re relevant question to that next gen education, Aaron. Uh, at what age do the youngest family members have, get stock? At what point can they be gifted? Uh, it, uh, is it is it dependent on the family branch? Uh, so it is it's ultimately up to the family, and, and frankly, there's um, we've got babies that hold shares, or their their minors trust does, um, and so there's no restriction there. And then. When the family members turn 18 is when uh, we start conversations about folding them into kind of the adult assembly is what we call it. Um, and so they'll get uh, orientation of our governance structure, um, our, the family mission and value statement, all of that. Um, and prior to age 18, they're going through things, learning that. At family camp, we do activities that try and draw out the values of the family, um, what the corporation's about, what our, our products do. Um, all sorts of things in that nature, but it's not real formal uh, per se until that 18 uh, age range. And uh, just another follow-up question, Graham, if I could. Uh, your, that evolution of the Vermeer family office is really fascinating because essentially it's an embedded family office, but you have a separate family office staff, which keeps the, can you talk about that a little bit? When did that occur? Because usually an embedded family office, uh, you know, causes the CFO of the corporation to go mildly insane while trying to be, you know, the business CFO as well as the family CFO. And that's a lot of reason why people launch single family offices. So in a sense, you're a single family office embedded within the corporation, correct? Can you talk yep. that through? Yep. Nope. And that certainly I know would have been the case, you know, back even 25 ish years ago, um, we would have my, my father and our CFO would have been uh, tearing their hair out on occasion uh, with some of those conversations. And so the need was clear. Um, and as as Gary Vermeer had stated back in the day, there's you know, I'm going to find a better way. Um, and that certainly was uh, what Bob Vermeer and then Mary Andringa uh, saw it when they started attending quite a few conferences and saw the need to build out a formal family office. And so the, the family office uh, was sort of separated from those um, positions back formally in 2014. Um, we had staff members that then um, started to have separate roles um, at that point and, and really carve out family office specific um, pieces there. A lot of those folks were um, support staff for um, would have been Bob and Mary, would have been the CEO and chair at the time. Uh, and so we moved over there and then we opened a physical office space that is separate um, where we sit in the corporate building, but um, have a, a separate office space here and that uh, opened in 2016. And so that's, I, I think, really helped the family 
um, be able to separate those um, in their mind. And then also um, for us, I, I think have more controlled interactions maybe with, with the business side, which um, I know the business and, and um, a lot of the folks over there appreciate that because um, while, while the family is uh, wonderful people, um, that, uh, that on occasion it's, it's nice to have a controlled interaction uh, with that. So, so it's been a, a fun evolution to see that. And that, uh, I think back to David's point, that really has allowed um, our finance teams and our legal teams to really focus on uh, you know, the business of the business and not um, have any overlap uh, onto the family side. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, the separation is really cool and, and probably creates a lot of efficiencies so that, you know, uh, the office of the CFO for Vermeer can focus on, you know, what's important to, to the business and, and you know, you can focus on uh, on the family and, and um, all of that equally important, but also quite separate functions there. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I, I think it's also uh, says a lot about, you know, how the company has done over time too, because, you know, it, you, you kind of need enough scale to, to get to the point where those, that separation of duties is really justified. Uh, and, you know, the company, uh, has done, has done very well, obviously. And so, um, that I think is, you know, maybe in the back of people's minds as they're thinking, you know, when is the right time to, to make that, that separation? Um, so, uh, I, I did want to, I, something that you were mentioning earlier about age differences kind of got me thinking um, or, or reminded me of something that we spend a lot of time thinking about is, you know, if you have shareholders of all ages trying to use the same system, um, it can be challenging. And so, um, you know, yes, the younger generations, I think, are, are very good at, at picking up, you know, on, on, on all of this very quickly. Um, but then you still have, you know, older generations that like to do things the way they've always been done. Um, and so, uh, you know, just, it, we, we spend a lot of time thinking about like, what is the, what is the home of, uh, you know, of these younger shareholders, these younger family members, where do they go as like their, their home base for the company? Because it is such a large part of their identity. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I just I, I think it's it's interesting how it's very different for d different age groups. Uh, it is, and we we have a I, I think uh, you know we have a very wide breadth of that. Yeah. Um, and a lot of our older generation are, uh, I think they're actually going to find the move very interesting um, to your system and to really visualize um, for them what uh, you know how many one how many trusts they have. Um, and are attached to, and then two of the value of those, because um, that's just not something that we uh, have traditionally visualized. I, I think they know it, um, and certainly when they attend the annual shareholder meeting and, and get the business update, that um, you know I, I think they're thinking of that. But it it'll be a powerful tool to put in their hands of to really visualize uh, what do you have here, and then uh, a wonderful uh, tool to visualize to their gifting strategy down to, to their kids and grandkids and beyond um, is and I, I think that is a powerful tool to give them the ability to do that at the dinner table and to kind of have a conversation if they've got uh, kids that are coming of age or or maybe it's uh, their children that are in 30s and 40s and to say hey this was how you know your grandfather, uh, did this and, and why I've continued to, to gift in this certain way and yeah. um, tell that story of, of that legacy is is a unique way, uh, I think, for us to to help facilitate that conversation and, and one that I hope gets a more holistic understanding of truly what they have been doing and passing those shares. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, these regular learning forums that, that you host, uh, and I'm... Uh, I feel very lucky to uh, to be able to be a small part of that in a couple of weeks. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about what are the topics there and how, how are those topics determined? Um, you know, how do you how do you set up the agenda for those those learning forums? Yeah, so those learning forums came out of uh, uh, an education committee. So our ownership council has those two large committees, education and governance, and education identified. Um, 
you know, a, an online learning forum as, as a good uh, conduit um, for there to be an item of importance out to the family and to try and hold those. We hold one in the fall and one in the spring um, and try to do that every year. And those topic areas can range from uh, we had, uh, or we have uh, a piece on um, how our dealers um, support disaster relief. So uh, mm-hmm. unfortunately a very topical um, conversation right now and, and praying for all the folks in Florida that uh, hopefully make it out um, of the storm uh, on the better side. Um, and so we, we had a, one of our guys, uh, our dealers in Maryland talk through his process of ordering equipment after a storm, sourcing that possibly from other dealers, um, if if all that uh, didn't work out, and then how a lot of their customers end up being the, the first responders in after a storm and cleaning up the streets and whatever. And so we we were trying to tie the importance of what our products do um, and, and try to get our younger generation to understand that. And then that also gets them to understand what our distribution network is for, for the products that we do. Um, and so try to tie in a little bit of business stuff with, uh, um, with some, with some good, uh, legacy there. And so, um, education committee also created a, a, a worksheet along with that. So a little bit of homework for the kids, um, to follow along in that discussion. So that was wonderful. My guess is, uh, many folks on this call probably aware of the corporate transparency act too, um, and the changes there. And, um, I think that'll be a, a a, a quick end of year learning forum too for us to, to make certain that um, everybody's aware of that and has worked with with their legal and tax advisors to to get that in hand. Yeah. So it's it's honestly that it's education committee's kind of uh, job to figure that out, and then we carry it out this year. Um, and I am very appreciative of you and your team's help and and in building out that learning forum here in a couple of weeks. It it will be. Um, a change of pace because we're going to change up how the folks are, are going to do proxy voting this year. And so with our uh, our annual shareholder meeting and vote in early December, uh, we figured it was a good time uh, six-ish weeks before that to get them uh, familiar with the system, have you guys present um, on how that system is going to look and work um, and answer any questions that, that they'd have on that front. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I think there are certain times when I, uh, at least when, when we find that rolling out a new system like this is makes a lot of sense. Proxy voting, like you mentioned, is one of them. Um, but also uh, around annual shareholder meetings uh, or, or even those like learning forums that you mentioned, uh, places where the family is already being brought together. Um, and it's it also provides a good time for us to get feedback. You know, what do family members want to see out of this? Um, and so um, you know, we, we feel like uh, we're very lucky to to be kind of extension of your team and and learn um, from all the you know experience and, and feedback that that we get from you. Um, I think I've actually driven by that that dealer in Maryland that, that you mentioned. Um, yeah, so. Mark Boyle out at Vermeer All Roads does a great job, and if yeah. you need a chipper out on the East Coast in this <laughs> area, give him a call. Yeah. Um, well, I, so I, I, I mean, I, I think I've gotten through a lot of what I wanted to ask you, but uh, you know, I, I wonder, David, are there other questions that have uh, there, there are um, so, <laughs> quite a few actually. Uh, so, Aaron, can you, if it's not confidential, can you share more about how you do the gifting, how the family does gifting through the trusts and so on? What, what are what are some of the strategies that you use? Yeah. And so each each nuclear family does it a little bit differently and has different needs. Um, and so uh, I'm working on a couple things uh, for some family. On a lot of folks have um, SLATs, Spousal Lifetime Access Trust. Um, and so we've gone through some different strategies there of um, gifts to um, a spouse uh, that then will wait six or eight months and then uh, set up a SLAT there. Um, for their benefit, then probably fill that hole um, with the, the chance of if that spouse passes, the other spouse loses ac- access to that income. Fill that with the life insurance trust, uh, and a, a commensurate policy there. Um, many folks um, also have 
uh, a lot of GST trusts um, for the benefit of their grandkids. And again, with back to the family's intent to hold um, the uh, the operating company, that that would um, seem to align very well with that. Um, we've also got a couple folks that have uh, in a branch of the family that has a dynasty trust. Mm -hmm. um, that's set up in a pretty unique way. It's a little bit interesting and actually just had a G1 pass away last year that uh, is going to necessitate a split of that dynasty trust um, onto the second level there. Um, and so it's a, it's honestly, we try to respond to the needs of each family. And there has been, uh, Gary Vermeer, I mentioned back at the beginning, Harry, his brother was also integral to the business. Um, early on, those brothers had a split back in the 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's been a, there had been a difference of opinion about how um, to treat those. And so traditionally, we've maybe had two different sort of regimes there about how to pass shares. But ultimately, working with uh, two different firms uh, to execute quite a, a bit of planning and uh, trying to respond mostly to, to whatever those uh, the family members want um, with, with respect to that. Sorry, it probably can't get incredibly specific. But. Right. But do all shares transfer from trust to trust or through trust? So there's no external internal market? Correct. Yeah. Uh, yep. Yep. And so, yeah, grand system is that internal market, but we have a, yeah, a, a very a very small number of events that would qualify as a purchase event um, for us. And then that's, again, the intention is the family has desired to um, to keep a lot of the shares in their family line um, and don't want them to get out. And so that uh, that's largely what our, our buy-sell agreement then follows is a lot of that ethos. Um, and so, frankly, there have been, I think, six events uh, over the course of the last 50 years where, where shares um, were bought back at, at some point and, and changed hands in ways that um, now would not be possible. Got it. Okay. Um, are shareholders also compensated with dividends or are those dividends put through the trust or they, how does, how does the dividend thing work? Indeed. So um, yeah, that's, um, uh, Switching my hat to sort of the, the business side of things. Right. Um, we've got uh, we've got a board of the business. That board's a plus one independent board, um, in keeping with best practice. Um, and so I have five truly independent directors um, there. Um, wonderful, wonderful people that we've been uh, lucky enough to uh, to have serve for us. Um, and then four family members. Um, one of those family member seats is reserved for the CEO slot. Um, and then we have three shareholder directors is what we term that. Uh, they go through a, a rigorous uh, development process there as judged by the ownership council that give them a development plan. And so um, we try to have the family members that serve on the board to, to take that as seriously uh, as we believe it's worth. Um, the board has a dividend policy that we pay uh, a, a certain percentage of, of profits out um, at the end of the year. Um, those typically flow to trust. There's a few people that still hold shares personally. Um, and so it would go to them personally too, but um, all that flows um, through our structure. And while we are not using Graham's system to, to pay dividends here, I know his, his system can um, mm -hmm. through ACH capabilities. And so that may be something we explore. Um, yeah, just didn't want to add one more piece to a, a already busy year. <laughs> Got it. Actually a quick follow up there. Uh, do you separate other separate accounts to pay taxes on those dividends or is that up to up to the family members to, to track themselves? Ultimately up to the family members. There's there's a few. We've got a few South Dakota trusts. And so the trust company up there um, that we utilize um, withholds that and, and helps us get that back to the family very easily. But ultimately uh, up to the family members. Got it. So how do you feel? This question is says philosophically, how do you think about trading <laughs> off that tailored approach for each family member versus something consistent for all? Um, how, yeah, if you prioritize we, uh, uh, uniqueness, how do you scale things or do you just deal with it? 
That's we've been at the just deal with it stage uh, okay. for a bit. Um, and I appreciate that question because that's kind of what I probably have a few less hairs than when I started <laughs> uh, the job a while back. But that is, I think, frankly, something that we're going to have to clarify with the family here over the next little bit and, and really understand that as a lot of these things have grown and, and um, just the numbers, the sheer number of people um, and trust that we have, how is that going to look? And ultimately, we can't get back to a, uh, the cat was out of the bag, right? When, you know, first sort of different started. And so we'll never get back to square one, but I think we can, we may be able to get to a place where we say, we're going to, you know, if, if I'm going to help the family, it's going to be through two or three providers and they're going to likely push these things and, and preferences for it. Um, and so my guess is that that's where we head, but ultimately that'll be up to the family and we'll see uh, whether or not uh, my tack is taken. Okay. Interesting. And you had mentioned the, uh, the relationship, you know, with the board and the, the board setting the dividend and so on. But are there regular meetings with the family office and the leadership team of the company outside of that? And if so, what is the relationship between both teams like? It is it is pretty close. And that that's happened probably more naturally because of, um, as Graham had mentioned, Ryan Agri. Um, was the, the family office director prior to, to my role. Um, and he also serves as our CFO. Um, and so he was in constant communication, obviously. With um, himself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> correct. And, and the rest of the team. Right. And no, and we, we try to have in our, our, our ownership council, frankly, and the, the board have lunches. And we, those meetings are also staggered at the same time. So we do quarterly ownership council meetings the same week and same day as the board. Um, and so we, we hold a lunch. Um, so those folks are communicating uh, constantly. Um, I'm in communication quite a bit um, with Ryan, with our general counsel, um, with others on, on the business side. And then our, our board uh, of the business also has a nominations and governance committee. Um, there are two seats reserved on there, one for the ownership council chair that we have, uh, who's always a family member, and then a seat for myself, the family office um, lead. Um, and so we will go in, give updates on what the ownership council is doing, uh, any updates with regard to estate planning that they may uh, need to know about. Um, luckily, that's that's been a pretty small risk. And so um, to the to the family's credit, they've done a good job of planning. So that, that hasn't had to be a big item, uh, but could be. And so those are the, the sources, I guess, of communication we use for that and the conduit there. Okay. Hopefully that makes some sense. It, it does, indeed. A quick shift of uh, thinking here. Um, does the Vermeer Family Office influence the Vermeer Charitable Foundation? Or, or I guess the better way of putting it is, are these completely separate? Is charitable giving separate from what you're doing? Or is that part of the, the remit? So charitable giving is certainly separate from the company. Um, and then actually in my role as in the family office, I help um, the charitable foundation with, they have a, a separate financial advisor um, uh, for their uh, investment account, a separate uh, board of directors, um, obviously for that foundation. And so I, I help as needed, I guess, on that front, but um uh, and actually our executive director sits in my office space as well uh, over here. So it's maybe not as separate as it, as it may seem, but uh, um, it is a, I, the, the family office helps uh, take care of anything that the foundation may need, I guess, if that's a, a satisfactory answer there. Okay. Well, then you mentioned something that kind of takes us into, you know, what other services does the family office provide to family members, which is a question here, as well as do you manage other investments for family members outside of their trusts and so on? It sounds to me like you do. So that actually we I we don't directly. Um, so we do not actually directly manage any outside investments uh, for the family. Um, I. I am alongside a lot of the family at a lot of meetings with 
their financial advisors. We utilize a group in Des Moines that we've got uh, longstanding family history with. Uh, and so I, 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 for lack of a better word, a lot of translator. Um, a lot of times between what the family's desires are, uh, those advisors aren't always available um, when the family members are available. So help kind of uh, translate any conversations that may happen um, outside of an email thread or outside of the, the typical updates um, that those folks have time for. So uh, it's a it's a lot of switching different hats, uh, but a, a very fun and uh, humbling role for me to, to serve in. So are, are those investment advisors like the Des Moines company, or is that part of that group of sort of the ideal approved providers? Okay. Yeah. And yeah. then do, do you provide other kinds of services? You know, family offices sometimes provide concierge services, tax planning, bill, pl bill pay, things like that. Or is that outsourced or up to the family? Most of that is, is outsourced. Um, we do provide a few concierge pieces. Um, and mostly it's in relation to folks that are local in Pella. Okay. Um, and so again, as the family has spread geographically, I think that may change um, a lot of the view about, is that fair you know, for, for folks that are outside of Pella? Right. And so that's, that's uh, top of mind, I think, for the ownership council um, to sort of dictate you know, what truly is the mission of the family office and what are we willing to get into and not get into. That's, that's so, great. It is as unique as, as each family is. I, I think that's the, the line that I've heard. I know in the family business community is if you've seen one family office, you've seen one family you've office. Seen, and if you've seen the Vermeer family office, you've seen like 25 different iterations of <laughs> how you're providing services, right? So interesting. Okay. So Graham, any last comments? Aaron, any last comments? I, I just want to thank Aaron. Uh, as as you just said, I know that you are wearing a lot of hats, and uh, you've got a very busy schedule. So we really appreciate you taking the time, um, and it's it's been really fun working with you over the last couple of years. Um, so thank you for everything. Thank you all, and it's been uh, it's a wonderful community to be a part of, and, and truly couldn't do it without folks like Graham, with you, David, and, and with everybody um, associated with the community. I know we have learned far more. Um, in the family enterprise community um, than, than I think uh, is possible to absorb. Um, but it's uh, it's truly a labor of love and it's, uh, it's a wonderful community to be a part of. So thank you. Well, thank you, Aaron, because your Vermeer has always been a company in our experience that's willing to share what it's done, what's worked, what hasn't worked, and that helps other family businesses. And Graham, I thank you so much for pulling this together because it's been a very edifying conversation. A lot of great questions from the audience. I hope all of you out there enjoyed this, and uh, I, I know that I did. So with that, I'm going to switch over and kind of end this session going to come up here and just say, if you're interested in working on more issues related to family offices, year-end planning, all of that, join us in, at Transitions Fall out in California next month. Uh, you can you can go ahead and click or, or scan that uh, QR code and find out more about this. Uh, but in the meantime, I wish all of you a wonderful holiday season ahead, whether you're doing year-end planning, gifting to trusts, any of the other things that need to be done, I hope you'll have time to enjoy with your family as well. This is, after all, family business. So with that, I thank all of you for joining us. We'll see you at the next webinar.